Okay, ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome to the Operational Intelligence Market Overview here with the Bloor Group and Inside Analysis talking about operational intelligence. And today we've got Julian Savage of KXEN on the line. So, Julian, I'm going to hand you the keys to the WebEx. Thank you. And if you would, yeah, just go ahead and share your desktop. There we go. Here it All is. right, so show us what you got. <laughs> All right, thanks, Eric. So, uh, well, what we got is uh, is um, is KXCN uh, products here. So KXCN is a pro is a predictive uh, analytics software vendor. We're based in San Francisco. Whoa! What happened? Some stuff. Hello. Hey, we lost for a second. Okay. Is it is that fine? Can you hear me well now? Yeah, I can hear you again. Your audio just kind of clipped out. Is that a VOIP that you guys have? Um, probably. I don't know. We've we've been having some voice voice IP problems lately. So I see. Sorry I think that. Let's go ahead. Since WebEx allows you to very easily set the start time, like you can cut off the front. So let's go, why don't you go back and I'll I'll re-record the uh, the mm -hmm. opening, and then we can just fix it in post. So okay, you're sure. Ready? All right, here we go. I am. <laughs> Well, ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome back to the market overview here at InsideAnalysis.com, talking about operational intelligence. This is Eric Kavanaugh of the Bloor Group, your host, and we have KXEN in the studio today. Of course, they are focused on predictive analytics. We'll kind of figure out where they fit in the operational intelligence space. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Julian Savage calling in from San Francisco. So, Julian, show us what you got. Thanks. Thanks, Eric. Um, so KXN, we're uh, a leading provider of, uh, of predictive analytics. We're a software vendor, um, a particularly strong in uh, four verticals, four industries, telecom, financial services, retail, and e-business. Uh, today, over 500 uh, customers, leading brands in the world, use our solutions, uh, typically uh, to answer things around CRM questions. So in telco, as everyone knows, Churn is a very uh, is a very big question. It's a very important business pain, and we help them. We help telecom uh, carriers and operators uh, answer things like who's going to churn, but not who's going to churn, uh, who churned in the past, but who's going to churn in the future. And as I will as I will explain a bit later, this is where uh, all the predictive technology really comes in place uh, because uh, you want to prevent your customers from churning. And if the people already churned, well, it's too late. Uh, we also help them um, answering questions like, what's the next best action to take? What are the next, uh, the, the right, you know, product, products or offers or handsets to propose them? Can we win back uh, customers in case they churned? Things like that. Um, what's interesting here, I guess, is you see big logos. Um, some are, um, I would say, North American ones. Some others are. Uh, European or even uh, uh, Asian or Middle Eastern, uh, things like Vodafone, um, uh, for example, very big in Europe. Uh, we, have, uh, we work with over eight Vodafone properties in the world. Um, but also, uh, you have other logos that obviously are not here uh, for Talco and also for the rest of the industries of smaller companies. And this, this is something I really want to insist on is um, we don't really work with um, the biggest, I mean, we work with the biggest uh, B2C companies in these four verticals, but also smaller companies, smaller SMBs, tend to like our solutions because it's very easy to use. And I guess the demo will, uh, uh, will nicely complement that. So because KXCN is a tool of productivity and it helps big companies answer these business questions, big companies like Cox and Orange and Wells Fargo and all that, Users, but also because we're easy, smaller companies tend to like our solutions. Uh, financial services, retail, e-business um, are the other uh, verticals we're pretty strong in. Um, so again, big names with uh, uh, FinServs like Wells Fargo, ING, uh, Discover in the States, uh, Barclays or Lloyds in uh, the UK. Uh, retail and e-business being uh, also very uh, strong focus for us. So. Uh, in terms of um, 
I would say market and analyst recognition uh, were recognized as a disruptive leader. So that may sound kind of uh, odd, disruptive leader. It comes from mainly Gartner and Forrester uh, reports, things like um, vendor rating for Gartner or like uh, Forrester Waves for Forrester, where we were categorized as both a disruptor for Gartner and a leader for uh, Forrester in that customer analytics wave. Um, that was published last November uh, 2012, I remember. Um, also Aberdeen Group, um, they um, carried on a couple of the benchmarks and we were uh, recognized as being three times faster when it comes to building predictive models. Uh, so the, before we really um, go a bit more into what really we propose and, and, and the products, the, line of, the lines of products we have, and I'm saying lines because we really have now two kind of separate lines of products, although uh, based on the same predictive engine under the scenes. Before going into that, I want to make sure the audience understands uh, what predictive analytics, or sometimes still called data mining, is. So predictive analytics typically helps um, uh, these B2B or B2C organizations uh, in four domains, CRM, risk, operations and fraud. The most classical applications for us are CRM. 80% of our business is around CRM use cases. In CRM, you can do things like, uh, as I said, um, pre prevent the people, the customers to churn, preventing also them to, um, uh, to, yeah, to a trip. You can also boost your VAR marketing campaigns. You can do things like cross-sell and upsell. So if you want to know um, uh, what are the, the customers that are likely to purchase or to adopt one given product or one given service, you can do that with predictive models. Uh, and and the also, uh, more, even more obviously, of course, everything around customer segmentation. So these are the classical traditional CRM applications of predictive analytics. Um, and I would say this is really the focus of today's presentation and the focus of our business. Having said that, of course, we have nice, reference, nice references in risk, fraud, and operations, but that will not be uh, the focus of, 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 of my presentation today. A great thing about predictive analytics, I guess, is um, it's very operational, right? It, it delivers great results. Uh, so many things um, you can do with predictive that would be really tedious to do with traditional BI um, or reporting tools. If you, um, if you think about about it, if you are able in advance to you know, predict who's going to churn or who's going to adopt a given service, etc., then you can really optimize your marketing campaigns, and this means uh, great ROIs and great results. So here I'm just giving a couple of these, of, of these results. Uh, CRM, um, one of the biggest um, a marketplace in the world, it's in Europe, so here in the States people might not know it, but it's called Allegro. It's the second biggest market, marketplace in the world after eBay, huge company. They have uh, 20 million subscribers, I mean uh, visitors, uh, uh, and they could increase their click-through rates uh, on their websites. Risk would be typically, a, a risk example would be Discover. Uh, using our solutions, they could uh, uh, save over $5 million a year on credit risk. Um, operations, that's an, a Russian example. Um, I like to pick up examples from all around the world to show that we're a really a worldwide company. Uh, and this, uh, this company is called Eldorado. It's the biggest uh, electronics retailer in Russia. They could improve their sales forecast by 10%, so that's really deeply operational. And when it comes to fraud, we have a, a portfolio of, uh, of, of examples and applications. One of them uh, I like is the, because it's public administration. It's a <coughs> excuse me, European Commission. Uh, that's the, the flag you can see here on the right side. Uh, they could detect 85% uh, of uh, fraud uh, with, uh, with only 30% consignments. So these are just, again, um, examples, but uh, examples that show that you deliver great business results. Um, so now let's get a bit more into the how part. So how do you get to these results, and uh, how can, uh, can you really achieve and optimize every customer interaction from customer acquisition to customer retention through all the cross-sell and upsell activities. Um, the, the, you, you need more models. Uh, and and uh, it has become obvious that um, 
there are always more offers that are proposed to customers in general, always more channels. Think about all the social channels, of course. So if you multiply the number of offers by the number of channels, uh, you lost your audio there again. Hello. Okay, you're back. Yeah. Okay, I don't know where I was uh, cut up. <laughs> That's okay. It was just about ten seconds ago. Okay. okay. Right. Uh, we're really sorry. I mean, this is we're okay. been experiencing bad, yeah, bad, bad uh, connections nope. lately. No worries. Go ahead. Okay. So yeah, what I was saying was that uh, because you opti you got to optimize more uh, customer interactions because you've got more uh, possible products and offers and more channels and you've got a lot of uh, you know customer uh, past historical data. Um, you need more models. If you want to optimize one campaign, you need one model. Uh, but uh, actually, you need one model per campaign per channel. So think about the number of combinations that you will uh, need to optimize, and this uh, means that you have uh, an increasing um, demand for uh, modeling and for insight in general. The problem with that, and this is a very famous Gartner chart, is that um, with traditional crafted, handcrafted approaches, you just cannot scale, right? Uh, there's no way uh, old tools can keep up to that level of, uh, of, uh, of insight that is required. So, um, <clears throat> and a couple of reasons be behind that, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, first, the, uh, the predictive uh, techniques that uh, have been used for now years and years, almost decades, uh, are, are getting kind of old, you know. They're, uh, they're not agile enough, uh, they're still very manual, uh, you still need um, very skilled resources, uh, all the data scientists, uh, to be able to develop your models, to be able to maintain them, to be able to prepare analytical data, to be able to then retrain the model, then uh, schedule the model, uh, refresh, and all this. So it's still very slow and very manual and very um, you know, cumbersome. And this is uh, one of the reasons why, um, as Garner mentions, that um, there is this gap between uh, really what's needed in terms of modeling uh, applications and what can be delivered. And this is really where uh, KXN comes in place. Uh, I guess the old value prop of the company is to try to you know, fill that gap and uh, uh, deliver uh, uh, a lot more productivity uh, to all these companies who need to optimize much more campaigns. Um, another um, um, chart here, this comes from a Rexer uh, analytics survey um, showing that, um, showing all the phases of the predictive analytics project. And this is uh, really uh, illustrating the fact that, um, you know, with, uh, with legacy tools, it takes too long to prepare, to deploy, to manage your, your models, right? Uh, and as you see, um, the, the, the big part here on the bottom right of the chart is data analysis, data prep, uh, and coding. Uh, this takes about uh, more, even more than one third of your uh, data mining project. So, uh, and, and the model building takes about 20% uh, of it. So if you could really gain some time and uh, um, boost the productivity of these stages one by one, imagine the time uh, that you will save, and then uh, the, but the potential uh, incremental value that will, you will get out of that automation. Um, so that's where, as I was saying, that's where uh, KXN value prop comes in place. So we typically are well known for being an easy to use tool. Um, uh, there's, um, there's no complex setup. Uh, you don't really need a, a PhD in stats to be able to build a model. Um, every time we, uh, we go for you know, proof of concepts or things like that with our prospects, we really typically ask for half a day or maybe one day for that exercise. They give us the data and after a couple of hours we already have a good model that they could like, put in production tomorrow. So the time to market, the time to model is key uh, and is a very strong uh, component of our offering. Of course, because we're fast, we're also more productive. So that kind of resonates to what I was telling you about, um, you know, the, the increasing number of campaigns that needs to be optimized, 
uh, if you have more complaints to optimize, you need a tool that uh, a tool of productivity, a tool that is able to uh, to scale that demand for insight and for modeling. And the last part, I guess, is um, big data. Uh, again, big data, big data is a big deal. It's a big term, and there's a lot of uh, a buzz and sometimes fluff around it. Uh, so I got a couple of really key data points to prove that uh, when we talk about big data, we really mean um, uh, that we address big data problems. And by that, I mean uh, high di what we call high dimension problems, things around the number, not the number of uh, customer records, but the number of customer attributes that we can uh, deal with. So um, let's go to the our product lines, I was telling you, uh, we we are we have like two um, two almost separate product lines now, uh, although they're founded on the same uh, creative engine. Uh, the traditional on-premise uh, line of uh, business for us um, is the one you see on the left side of the slide, uh, something we uh, we we created over 10 years ago, and the the, the other one you see on the right side of the slide is uh, our new multi-tenant cloud uh, uh, offer. And that was launched uh, late um, September last year uh, with a, a, a portfolio of apps, and I will, I will talk about that. So on the traditional on-premise side, you see six modules. All of them, if you get back to um, the Rexer chart that I was showing before, all of them actually are taking care of one of these um, data preparation or model building phases, right? Trying to, again, automate and, and make each and every step more productive. Modular, uh, for example, our module for data preparation helps you build um, uh, da your data, uh, build your model, sorry, uh, faster. Explorer helps you automating your data prep. Scorer, it's all that uh, in database analytics where you can actually score and deploy your models in production in your database or data warehouse environment. And then on the right side of that left side, uh, social factory recommendation. These are, I would say, newer modules that we launched over the last, the last three or four years. Social is our social network analysis module. We analyze the relationships between customers or subscribers if you're in a telco environment and we try to boost your viral marketing initiatives. We try to know who are you, influencers, uh, things like that. Factory will um, be the model building and model refresh uh, automation layer on top of the rest. And finally, um, a module that we launched um, two days ago, I think, if I'm not mistaken, oh, I'll say hey, this week, is our uh, recommendation engine module, things around uh, you know, um, build recommend product recommendations for uh, websites. Uh, so that's the traditional on-premise offer, multi-tenant cloud. We'll talk about it, and I guess uh, the best way would be for me to show you uh, um, uh, a demo. It's going to be much more informative for the cloud. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Uh, so quick, quick slides on the, um, uh, quickly a couple of slides more on the on-premise solution. I really want to uh, explain the old vision of it, and uh, then we'll go to the cloud and the demo. Um, typically, where we uh, where we are, it's we sit between you know um, the data warehouse and uh, things like marketing marketing automation apps, or even CRM and call center uh, apps or or clouds, for example, or systems. Um, so, it, and this is where you see us in the in the in the middle. We extract patterns from data warehouses uh, through data marts or not. Uh, we analyze these patterns to create that predictive model. Um, so when I mean patterns, I mean typically historical customer data, right? Uh, things, if you take telco, for example, things like for each customer, um, well, social demographics, of course, but also a lot of usage data. How many calls have I done last, last um, did I do last week, last day, uh, last month? All these things um, around behavioral, uh, the behaviors of, of, of the customers. These are the patterns, and then we correlate these patterns to the probability of churning in the future. And we apply that in batch mode or in real time uh, to these marketing automation uh, systems or to CRM or call center uh, systems. 
So that's kind of the architecture of KXCN. Um, remember, these are here on, on, the, on the right side, you see the phases of the data mining or predictive analytics project, problem analysis, data prep, building models, deployment, review and improve. These are the things that uh, used to take time, uh, a lot of time before uh, Infinite Insight, before KXCN. And after uh, KXCN, with our Infinite Insight um, uh, suite of products, uh, you, you see that you can build faster and, and better models um, very easily. So, and that again comes from uh, various um, figures from various surveys. One quick word around big data. I want to prove that um, big data is something real for us and, and even more real for our customers. All of them are, almost all of them using um, big data in a sense. So before 2010, um, the data, the customer data that was um, modeled and analyzed was pretty much around CRM data, maybe ERP data with purchase history, and maybe sometimes, in really the best of the world, um, you know, uh, clickstream data. Uh, and uh, if you add these data uh, for each customer, you might end up with, you know, a couple of hundreds uh, attrib attributes for each customer, which is good, uh, but it's not optimal. Think about all the new data sources, things around web, mobile, social media, ad servers, call logs, um, you know, structured data, semi-structured data, unstructured data, all these sources of customer um, data actually now can be appended to, um, to what you had in the past, and we typically build models on top of thousands of variables today. So we're not talking about hundreds, we're talking about thousands. And the beauty of that is it's not just for the pleasure of being big data compliant, you know. Uh, it's, the beauty of that is the more data you have, the better the models will be because you get more information about your customers. Uh, and that's where I want to show this little sequence of, 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 of charts. Uh, and again, this is based on real data. So that chart is the performance of, the, of your model, the quality of detection of your predictive model. You can see that in, um, in blue. So the closer the blue curve gets to the green one, the better and the more accurate your predictive model will be. If you take 20 variables, so fairly limited amount of variables uh, in your model, you will have typically this type of curve. If you take 100, so these 100 being more like being 20 variables plus all the, pi the pivoting transactions, things like how many calls, uh, how many SMSs sent, received, how many uh, you know, MMS uh, sent, received, etc. cetera, uh, more time-sensitive aggregates, things like number of calls per week, per month, all these are informative in nature, and if you add that to your model, to your analytical data, you rebuild your model, and as you see, the performance is better. But it's not over yet, because the last dimension you can take into account is all the social data, right? Whether structured or unstructured. So if you add social network analysis data to your data, to your uh, analytical um, data, things like number of calls, uh, number of churners you are talking to, uh, you, know, you know, community churn rates, etc. You have in this real life example 200 variables, and then the performance chart becomes better. So that's why, for us, big data is not so much about you know dealing with uh, more uh, customer um, records. Of course, we can do that, and of course, we've always been doing that. Um, but it's really how uh, wide uh, you, can, you can go in terms of analytical data, and the more variables you can include in your model upfront, the better, because the more accurate the model will be. Yeah, and could, These you, are a couple of, yeah, could yeah. you actually just go back to that slide, and just for, for clarification purposes, just go back, yeah. Just explain exactly, sure. so uh, the, the red line is random, of course, the blue line yeah. is validation. Can you explain, just to be clear, what all those lines mean and, and what you were showing right there? Sure, yeah, good point. Sorry, I was kind of assuming. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah, so um, the, the, the red line is the, model, is, the, is the random model, right? So, well, first, let's explain the axis, and then let's explain the curves. So the, the, the x-axis is the percentage of your customer population you're targeting. Um, so if you, for a given campaign, for example. So um, 
if you take, for example, 10%, then you want to know if in your 10% um, uh, target list, how many churners, future churners, you will be able to detect, for example. And that, that real-life example is a churn model. So that's exactly it. I want to know how many, and that's the y-axis. I want to know if I take, say, 10%, what are the number of the proportion of all the future churners that I will be able to grab, to, to, to detect in advance. If it's a random model, and that's the red curve, the red line here, if you take 10% random, well, you will detect 10% of your churners. And um, as for the green curve, this is the what we call the wizard model. So that's the perfect model. That's the model that never fails. You know, you take someone who's about to churn, the model will say, this is a churner. Or you take someone who will not churn, the model will say, this person will not churn. So that's your optimal. Uh, and of course, it's very theoretical, so you can never obtain that quality of model because a model always makes mistakes. And then, finally, the last and third uh, blue curve is the model you built. In that case, the model we built with KXCN. So that model sits somewhere between you know, a random selection of your customers and the perfect sele selection in green of your customers. So the way you would interpret that would be if I take 10% of my churners, these 10% being determined by the model, actually they correspond to the 10% highest churn scores, then if you take these 10%, you would obtain, uh, I don't know how many, something like 30% of all my churners. So you actually obtain three times more churners using a model in this case than using a random selection. Gotcha. That's the purpose of that um, uh, performance chart. Yep. Okay, great. Thank you. Welcome. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, I was just giving you a couple of data points. I think we can we can uh, we can skip that. People, uh, I mean, if you are if you are more interested in this, we can uh, we can talk about it later uh, if, if necessary. Uh, these are again examples data points around the ROIs we could obtain. Um, Typically, the metrics uh, that will be optimized will be things like churn rates. So if you are able, and that's exactly the example I just uh, explained, if you are able to identify more churners, then you launch a, reten a highly targeted re retention campaign, and, uh, uh, and uh, provided you design the right offer, then you will retain more people, and then the churn rate will drop. So churn rate would be one metric we, we follow. We also follow, of course, I mean, our customers would follow things around campaign conversion, around response rates, around also um, click-through rates for you know, e-businesses and websites, et cetera. And as always, um, amazing results obtained in a, a fairly limited amount of, uh, of time because we propose that fast and easy to deploy um, type of solution. Um, before I move to the cloudy part, um, maybe you got some questions on that, um, I would say, traditional on-premise solution of ours? No, I'd go ahead. Okay. Um, so let's, uh, let's, let's see what, uh, what's happening in the, in the sky and in the, in the cloud. So what, uh, uh, and I want to articulate well on this uh, so that you understand the transition between our classical on-premise line of products and the, the, our um, uh, predictive apps in the cloud. Um, the, the, the fundamental premise of, of this is um, what you see with, uh, with the biggest cloud vendors is advanced analytics, although um, some of them are arguing uh, something else, it, our advanced analytics is one of the few remaining strengths that on-premise has over cloud. So there, these vendors, they are lagging in terms of advanced analytics uh, maturity. A couple of reasons for that is that they all started uh, typically with small, medium businesses where you know, deep uh, analytics is not such a critical need. Um, but as a matter of fact, they are now realizing that they are collecting more and more customer data uh, and, uh, and they need to compete in enterprise with on-premise for that. So this is where we, uh, we are trying to, 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 to come and play here. So uh, 
what we did is, and sorry, this is kind of a wordy slide, uh, and you don't need to read it all. You need, I guess, to understand the five uh, building blocks you see in blue on the left side. We really, because we have that, that level of automation, uh, when coming to building analytical data, when coming to you know robust modeling or applying the scores, refresh them, and also our API, because our core technology is all around automating predictive analytics, we could develop uh, cloud apps or third-party apps, where automation is not just you know a, a great to have; it's a must-have. Uh, you you cannot have a team of data miners. Uh, sitting somewhere in the cloud or in your data center, uh, uh, you know, coding and building the models for you. It needs to be a low-touch or no-touch uh, type of app, where typically what you do is you just uh, install um, one of our predictive apps in your cloud environment, can be Salesforce, can be something else, and then you let the model, the, the model learn on data, and then you take the outcomes of it. So. Um, that's where we transition from. We transition. We transition. Sorry, from um, being a data mining, predictive analytics, automation vendor to now uh, becoming more and more a predictive app vendor in the cloud. And um, so uh, that's why I guess my demo will focus on the the, the new predictive offer app that we uh, we released. Uh, recently, it's called Predictive Offers. Um, this app is for uh, the Salesforce cloud, uh, so it's it's available on the, on, on App Exchange. Uh, the idea is to uh, to propose next best activity. So I don't know if you're familiar with that term, or some call it best next activity or next best offer. Uh, it's typically in a call center scenario. Someone uh, calls you, calls the agent. Um, and uh, you know you, you got a bunch of offers, a portfolio of offers to propose him. And typically, what we see at the moment is two things. Either um, the same offer will be applied to everyone, kind of a one size fits all approach. So this is simplistic, and overall, it's not accurate. So your conversion rates will not be very high. Or you have very complex usually slow, hard to install, and uh, hard to you know, set up cumbersome, cumbersome systems, uh, the majority of them being based on uh, rule engines, very complex rule engines, uh, where you're trying to deal with uh, all that you know, um, offer optimization and next best activity. But the time spent on that, uh, in, uh, in, in the time and money spent on that by, by the end users uh, and by the companies is just uh, it's just unbearable. So, and that's why we proposed that 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 next best activity app with immediate time to value. So there's nothing you got you you, you you have to do really apart from you install the app from App Exchange, then you ask your Salesforce admin in that case to set up the offers, and I'm going to show you that in the demo, and uh, sh also set up the the, the rules. Uh, some very basic business rules on top of it. The setup is very easy. It's a really, it's a really, it's a really a point and click type of, uh, of setup. And then the system learns by itself. It's a self-learning engine, so it will use the past customer data stored in this case in the the, the Salesforce CRM, um, and it will uh, typically deliver a probability for each offer to be accepted by this person or not. And that is done in real time. So let's maybe switch to um, to the demo. I hope you can still see my uh, my uh, internet browser and my screen. Not yet, but it, I bet it's coming. Uh, maybe I have to. I can see it. Maybe I have to share it okay, <laughs> so that I you can see it. I see it. <laughs> you can maybe. see it. Okay. So I don't know how familiar you are with, uh, with with the Salesforce console. That's the Salesforce console, so uh, service cloud uh, for a call center, typically. In my scenario, it's a B2C um, scenario where uh, Cableco is a large cable um, uh, provider. And uh, you see here the names of the persons. So let's assume that I'm, I'm an agent, and I'm receiving a call from Mr. Jethro Abbott. What a strange name, but still, uh, why not? That's typically what the agent 
will see. He will see um, a couple of uh, you know, customer fields here on the left side, and also he will see the best offer to propose to Mr. Abbott. That best offer is not uh, determined randomly or by a one-size-fits-all approach or by very complex business rules. No, it's determined by predictive models. That exact same technology I've spent some time explaining you um, is actually here behind the scenes. So if we view all the offers <coughs> that are available, in this case, uh, we have four distinct offers uh, on the left side, Cable Co. Showtime, Cable Co. 3D, Cable Co. DVR, and Cable Co. Home Security. And you see that you have a probability that is assigned to each and every offer for that particular person, Mr. Abbott. And you see in also that uh, the first one popping up, the, the maximum probability, in this case around 4%, a bit more than that, is, uh, is the showtime offer. Uh, and behind that, you have a predictive model. You have a predictive model telling you the probability of Mr. Abbott to accept that offer. And as always with predictive models, you don't have just a probability. You also have the why part, and that's very important. You have things we call um, variable contributions. So you want to know why Mr. Abbott received that score, that probability. Well, these are the reasons. So it's kind of you know adding and then subtracting the values. Uh, and you can see in his case that the fact that he's a male and the fact that uh, his income range is between this and that, and he, uh, he lives in uh, West Virginia, that seems to positively, positively contribute to his uh, likelihood of accepting that offer. Whereas the fact that he's never married is kind of um, uh, playing a, a negative role in, uh, in here. And that would be the same for all the offers. So it's, it's exactly the same predictive uh, model uh, technology that is behind the scenes, but applied now in real time. And when I say real time, I think uh, this is something important is to keep in mind, this is all done in, uh, in the Salesforce uh, cloud and an environment. And that's why it's really real time. So uh, if I change some stuff here, for example, let's assume that Mr. Abbott became a homeowner, for example, which is a very simple um, change. You see that the offer was updated. So it's no longer a showtime, it's now a DVR. Why that? If I go and check the all offers again, I see that the maximum probability here that popped up in front of the others is uh, the DVR. And again, if I want to see with an 11% probability, again, if I want to see why, I can um, see that same type of um, you know um, variable um, stack range chart, and I would see that the fact that he's an homeowner also played a big um, a big game. I mean, the big role in him um, accepting this uh, this offer. So that's the way it works. Uh, the 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 beauty of it is, it's, as you see, it's a really low-touch thing. So the agent, maybe the agent won't even have that button, uh, the view all offers. Maybe he will. That is to be set up by the Salesforce admin. But what's for sure is that every offer you will see here on the, on the right side of the screen with a given little script uh, will be uh, optimized by a predictive engine uh, under the scene. And that's, um, that's about it. So low touch app, um, uh, nothing but uh, go to app exchange, uh, install the package, and then it starts learning on historical data. Uh, what I can show you before concluding the, the demo and I guess that, that the call is maybe um, the more um, advanced um, Salesforce admin panel. So what the, what the admin would, uh, would, would, would set up would be, well, just like three or four parameters like this. So typically after how many responses can I start building a model, things like that. And it's very easy for the Salesforce admin to also create a new offer. So if I um, go to that um, tab, that offers tab, you see the four offers that, uh, that were already created. I want to create a new one like this. I want to say, okay, it's, uh, it's uh, an offer on HBO. I want to make it um, activated as of yesterday, 7th of March, for example. I want to add a little, um, sorry, a little script in here, uh, free HBO for three months, for example, or something like that. 
that will be the script that my agent will see. Then I want to uh, have the creative part here, right? So I want to choose uh, one uh, nice little image to be to be displayed in my uh, in my Salesforce uh, console, and I can also choose a banner like this and upload it, and that's it. So this is all you need to do to set up and create a new offer is just uh, basically the title of the offer, activation date, the script maybe, and a couple of nice creative images. And once you've done that, you already, uh, you're able to see that Mr. Um, Jeff, Jeffro Abbott has other offers. So that's the one I've just created. Of course, this is a new offer. So uh, the, um, uh, the model is, there's no model yet because you need a minimum number of responses to be able to, you know, build your model. But after 500, in my case, such responses, then this new HBO offer will have this, just like the other ones, will have the same uh, thing that, that is to be, uh, that is to say a, pro a probability of, uh, of acceptance for each and every uh, customer. So that's about it for, I would say, for the, the cloud demo. Um, before maybe answering your possible questions um, or everything you need, just let me mention one last thing. Uh, this is just one example, uh, this predictive offer. Um, one, we also we have also released a predictive lead scoring um, app. This, this is a free app, uh, predictive offer, it's subscription based. Um, it's available on App, on App Exchange, and because uh, we developed a, a generic multi-tenant in, in architecture, uh, it's, it's going to be very easy for us to release new apps over and over again. And we're uh, very soon uh, from now planning to release a, an app in, still in Salesforce uh, for predictive retention. Um, so uh, this is exactly ch the churn example that I was mentioning, but in the cloud. And uh, also some some uh, another app around um, creative case uh, routing. With that, I guess that concludes my um, my my presentation. Possibly the demo, unless you want to see uh, the on-premise. Um, yeah, product. that would be great. That would be great. And uh, we got about eight minutes left. I'd like to see the um, very quickly, if you could, the on-premise, because my recollection from the last briefing we took from you guys is that you have a very nice well thought out workflow and I guess maybe while you're digging that up I'll just ask that's a very very neat little tool there that you've and have you essentially embedded that in Salesforce or how does it actually stitch together is someone actually logging in to Salesforce and then calling that as an embedded application or how does that work <clears throat> so you um, first you we, we have our own cloud um, uh, built uh, and it, it sits next to, to Salesforce. Okay. Um, and and, um, and uh, what we do is, um, and I think I got a, let me pull up a architecture slide. Yeah, that one. So what we do is we really take, take all the heavy lifting and the, the heavy computation uh, 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 tasks are done in, in Salesforce. So what we do is all the data prep, it's done in Salesforce in, that, in Apex. Then that would be uh, given to, um, to, to our cloud, to the KXN cloud. It would uh, spawn up a couple of uh, KXN instan instances to be able to you know, um, create the model and all this. And then we would kind of uh, uh, produce a, another uh, APEX score uh, that would be the scoring equation. And that scoring equation, you see here, uh, it here, will be actually um, um, executed in, in batch or in real time. So it's, um, I would say, KXN sits besides uh, Salesforce in here. And when you think of it, everything happens within Salesforce. The only times where you gotta uh, do a bit of data IO will be when you have to retrain your model. But once the model is trained, it's just another equation that will be executed in within Salesforce. Okay, great. And then and do you the, also, I mean, are, you, are you working on, right. um, are you working on solutions that connect to things like eye contact or constant contact or WebEx or any other significant cloud-based CRM type tools? Yes, we are. So the reason why we started with Salesforce is because it's by far the biggest cloud vendor. <laughs> so uh, we, uh, we, we, we think we have uh, something great to, uh, to propose in this. 
But again, as I was telling you, because we have to build that really generic infrastructure and architecture, we can really apply that type of technology to other uh, cloud vendors, uh, the ones you've mentioned, or also you can think about NetSuite or, um, I don't know, a Primo, et cetera, or, or exact target. Um, it, it's, uh, that would be really a, a, a fairly limited amount of work to uh, transpose everything I've shown here in the Salesforce cloud to the other uh, cloud vendors, yeah. Okay. And this is part of the plan for this year, yeah. Oh, great. Um, okay, so real quick demo, uh, <laughs> because we got like uh, five or three minutes uh, yeah, left. Yeah, five minutes is can fine. You, okay, can you see, see okay, great. Uh, let me, just one second, sorry. So, um, the, the, when I say, uh, when I'm talking about automation, uh, I hope this will show that. So what you do here, I'm about to build a churn model. So I'm just selecting the data I want to use to build my model, right? Uh, in my case, um, uh, that data has been prepared uh, with our data prep module called Explorer, and I'm using our modeler module to build my predictive model. So all I need to do is really uh, specify the date as of I, um, the date of what we call the reference date. Uh, that date will be the date, the kind of the, the snapshot in which you want to build your model. You want to freeze your data with that date, say for example, um, 1st of uh, October last year. This is the data that I have, a pretty recent one. And I want to say, okay, let's freeze the, the, the view I have on my, of, of my customer base as of that date and build the model and build the data using that. Uh, and what you see here, maybe I can make it a bit bigger, is that you have a bunch of um, you know, customer fields. Um, this is just a demo, so in real life you would have more than that. Um, so you have things around social demographics, you have things around uh, social uh, type of data, coming from social network analysis, you have more basic uh, behavioral variables, things like how many uh, voice calls or um, how many SMSs were done last month, last two months, last three months, um, uh, what's the average age in your community of friends, for example, if you think about the social uh, media uh, side of the data, um, and also gender, uh, zip code, uh, device, and all this. Uh, and and that's, that would be your, your behavioral data, and then all you need to do is just specify the business target you want to predict. In my case, I want to predict who's going to churn in one month from now. And then, because I have also these other two targets that are who's going to churn in two months and who's going to churn in three months, I'm going to include them for the, for the analysis. And that's all, right? So next, uh, and you're already ready to build your model. I generate that. And the model will be built in, in no time. Uh, of course, it's a big data set. Remember, it's a demo, so it has like 50 variables and not so many rec records. But still, what's really important is that, is in that is, we don't propose a stat workbench. You don't need to select the algorithm and then you know, fine tune it and uh, it doesn't work and then you need to loop back to uh, choosing another algorithm and et cetera. This is really like, you hit that next button a couple of times, and here it is. You already have your model. It's ready to be used. It's ready to be debriefed. And when I talk about debriefing, you see the, the exact same type of information I shown you in the in the, the cloud uh, part of the demo. But that's uh, for the on-premise solution. You want to know why people are churning. For example, well, in, it seems like the number, the amount of calls you do to your friends. Uh, is very influential. If you, if you tend to do a lot of calls to them, this, for example, then you're less likely to churn. And all that, so you are really able to stack rank all the, the customer data and all your variables to be able to explain why people are churning. And, um, and the same, uh, if you want to run your model, you want to apply it, um, you want to say, for example, uh, you want to obtain the probability of churn in the future, so let's do something like this, and then um, we'll apply that. Remember, the model was built uh, 1st of, um, of October, 
So now I want to apply it 1st of November, for example. I'm doing this, and I will obtain pretty quickly a list of scores uh, that you see here. That's the column um, probability of, of churning in one month from now. And um, I can sort that list. This is the customer key column. I can sort that list. That's what I've done. And then, well, I see that Mr. 3569 has a very high probability of churn. He's like 62.8% uh, uh, with the uh, uh, likelihood of churn. And these others are pretty risky too, and then you got less risky people. So that's it. That performance chart I mentioned to you and I shown you earlier as well, it comes from there, from that, right? You, you, sure, you, you score your customers, you know who's uh, likely to churn in the future, and then you select the top something, the top 10%, uh, for example, and this will be your target list for your optimized marketing campaign. Wow, great stuff. All right, folks, thank you so much for that uh, rather in-depth demo and the presentation leading up to it. Folks, we've been talking to Julian Savage of KXEN. Uh, I love the cloud-based offering. I'm looking forward to what's coming down the pike and when you guys get uh, eye contact and constant contact in there, I'll be knocking on your door. <laughs> great, you will be welcome. Okay, folks, you've been listening to a market overview review of KXEN, part of the Operational Intelligence Market Overview. We're doing it at InsideAnalysis.com. I'm Eric Kavanaugh of the Bloor Group. That does conclude our event here for today. And with that, I will bid you all farewell. Thanks so much, folks. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>